I'm Adam Pascarella, and welcome to episode 28 of The Power of Bold. From New York City, it's The Power of Bold, the podcast on risk-taking, entrepreneurship, and bold living. Join us as we interview world-class performers, analyze life-changing books, and gather actionable insights to help you achieve your goals. Here's your host, Adam Pascarella. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to our latest episode of The Power of Bold. We're on to episode 28, and I'm stoked to share my conversation with Darren Roberts. As you know by now, I enjoy reading business, career, and self-help books. And once I came across Darren's book, I knew I had to get him on the podcast. Darren has had one of the most non-traditional careers that I've heard of for a law school graduate. He attended Harvard Law School. And instead of following the crowd and becoming an associate at a white shoe law firm, he pursued his dream of working in the NFL. Darren put in the work and rose up the ranks to become a coach for teams like the Kansas City Chiefs, Detroit Lions, West Virginia Mountaineers, and the Cleveland Browns. Now he works at the University of Texas and is the founding director of the Center for Sports Leadership and Innovation. Darren speaks about his transition from the legal world to the NFL in his book titled Call an Audible, Let My Pivot from Harvard Law to NFL Coach Inspire Your Transition. The book highlights Darren's experience breaking into the Kansas City Chiefs organization as a law school grad. In our conversation, we spoke about Darren's experience at Harvard Law School, why he decided to jump off the normal path to pursue a career in the NFL, things we can think about before making a large transition, and how he worked his way through the Chiefs organization to become a key member of the team. It's an absolutely compelling story, especially if you're thinking of making a significant career transition. But even if you're happy at your current job, Darren has some great advice on how you can achieve your career goals, whatever they are. Okay, with all that said, here's my conversation with Darren Roberts. Darren Roberts, thanks so much for appearing on The Power of Bold. Thanks for having me, Adam. I appreciate it. Glad to be on. So, so you truly have an awesome story, and as I was doing my research for this interview, I read that you were actually named one of the 75 most fascinating alumni of Harvard Law School, which is awesome. And once, once our listeners hear about your story and what you've accomplished, I have no doubt that they'll feel the same way. And so we, we've got a lot I to... Got, I got to correct you in case... Uh, <laughs> it's for the Kennedy School. Um, oh, okay. And, you know, they kind of did like an anniversary thing. I don't know how I ended up on this... Uh, this list, but uh, it, it was fun. So yeah, no, I had some good some good times there, and um, looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's that's an accomplishment nonetheless. It's it's truly incredible, and and we've got a lot to talk about from your experiences at Harvard Law School to your transition to the NFL and your current work at the University of Texas. But before all that, I'd like to start at the beginning. Um, in your book, you say you grew up in East Texas and that you were interested in politics from a young age. So, so when you were in high school, what did you think your career would look like, and and was becoming an NFL coach even part of that equation? Yeah, I wanted to be governor of Texas when I was in high school. So I was um, I was um, class president all four years. I was student body president my last year. Um, grew up in a home where my parents were politically active, and we had a lot of conversations around politics and. I did debate. So debate probably was one of those experiences for me. I did it for four years in high school. Um, it was one of those experiences that really, I think, exposed me to some of the interesting conversations around, um, you know, government and public policy. And so that was, for me, the, the dream, you know, back in Mount Pleasant High School. That's awesome. And and yet, yeah, debate is one of those those extracurriculars. I, I never did it, but I could see so many skills that you learned. And and so, when you're in high school and participating in debate, what what lessons or insights do you take from that and apply to, you know, obviously law school? It's it's pretty useful. But even in the NFL in your career, was was debate? Uh, w- w- did it provide that much uh, value? I'm, I'm sure it did. Yeah, you know, I I had a chance to see my old debate coach a couple of weeks ago back in Mount Pleasant. And I think one of the lessons that has always stuck with me that he used to teach was that um, it's good to have an argument. It's even better to have 
a good counter argument. Mm. Um, so he, he really coached us to even more so than thinking about kind of your case, but to think about what is the best counter argument to whatever we were proposing, you know, during our time in high school, the, the resolutions dealt with health care and Russia immigration. So those were the four resolutions, my four years in, in high school. And so he would always say that, you know, be able to anticipate what the other side, what's their best argument, and then craft the best counter argument. Um, and that's, that's what's going to win the day. So I think that, that, uh, you know, that lesson alone and just being around different teams and traveling around the state, you know, really helped to, you know, me to kind of hone my, my love for public service and politics. Sure. And yeah, that's obviously a, a very valuable skill if you want to become governor, like, like you said you did. Um, and so you, you attend the University of Texas for college and, uh, you're still interested in politics there, but in the book you describe how you uh, ran for student body president there and that you were elected, and that in and of itself is extremely impressive considering the size of the student body at Texas and, and how competitive that race must have been. So can you give the listeners a sense of like how you actually did that and, and what strategies you used to build support for your candidacy? Yeah, you know, I... Um... My first event, so I, I actually went to summer school at Texas the summer before my freshman year. I was at an event at the Texas Exes Association, which is our alumni group, sitting at a table, and the woman sitting next to me, her name is Annie Holland, and she's talking about the fact that she's going to run for student body president at UT. I'm a freshman. I mean, I'm fresh on campus. And so at the end of the conversation, she's like, hey, you should run on my ticket. Well, I thought she was kind of BSing me, and and uh, you know she reached out via email. So I was a freshman on this ticket of forty people. So at Texas, at the time, you had a president and a vice presidential candidate, and then you had reps for every college based on um, the enrollment of the college. And so a ticket usually ran, you know, forty people. And so I was one of the at-large reps which I thought meant that I was definitely going to lose because, you know, anyone could vote for me, but obviously no one knew me, um, you know, when we first started. But, you know, was fortunate enough to win a seat as a freshman, and sort of that was my introduction to, to student government. And then I was actually out of student government for a while, uh, my junior year, and then came back and ran. And uh, it's an intense period. So you have two weeks – you know, your cap at, at the time was 10000 in terms of what you can spend. Mm. You had about 200 volunteers. You're meeting daily for that two-week period. Um, and you had 1,000 student organizations that you needed to decide which ones you needed to, uh, to campaign to. So it was definitely probably the most challenging period of my life. Maybe first year of law school would rival – that period, but um, was fortunate to get into a runoff and win the runoff, and uh, you know was was SG president my last year. That's such a such a cool story. And if we think about you know self branding or self marketing, uh, what what lessons can we take away from your experience? You know, winning that that tournament, so to speak. Yeah, you know, I've, one thing I figured out because we would talk. I mean, you think about the University of Texas; you've got everything from, you know, the Judo Association, um, the Chi Omegas, the uh, Young Conservatives, and so I figured out pretty quickly that you could not be all things to all people, hmm. and we had to reduce our platform down to three points, which. I'm too old now, Adam, to remember a couple of them, but I remember like having to sort of recalibrate after the first two days of campaigning and come in and talk to our team about, listen, we need three points. We're going to decide which are the three most important things that we're pushing, and that's all that we're going to be talking about for the next two weeks. So I think really establishing the message and sticking to I'm, – I'm a big believer in the power of three, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that – to me, it's easier for you. It's easier for people to wrap their minds around, and it's it, it makes it hard to get off message. Can you explain what the power of three is? Yeah, so there's a lot of research around how um, 
when you start to, in, in terms of the mind remembering and recalling information, when you start to get north of three items, um, it becomes increasingly difficult for the brain to, to recall information that it's, you know, that it's encountered. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also some, you know, in the, in the psychology literature and some of the liter- in just literature, um, you know, if you think about the Trinity and there are these archetypes built around this notion of three. So um, for me, whether I'm crafting a speech or I'm writing a memo, I really try to stick to that rule. And, um, you know, it also goes back to debate where if I have three points, the weakest point is going to be sandwiched in the middle mm. because that's that's where it's most likely to get lost. Um, I'm going to lead with a good one, but my closing, you know, number three is going to be sort of my swing for the fences point. So, um, you know, that's something that's kind of guided um, my approach to communication since I was, you know, uh, in debate in high school. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that that makes sense. I think intuitively people feel feel comfortable with three. And you said the research backs that up. And so when you're at you're at Texas, you're still considering politics. Obviously, you're you're in student government. Uh, where where did law school fit into that? Were you always thinking of law school, or did it kind of come to you while you were at Texas? Yeah, you know, I read a lot. I mean, I, one of my, you know one of my favorite subjects was history, and so I knew that there was a pretty common trajectory of uh, members of Congress, the Senate, uh, be, you know, being lawyers. So. Um, Took the LSAT, got the recommendations. Everything was gearing up to go into law school. Um, after undergrad, Harvard was my number one pick, um, and you know I wasn't the number one pick for them. So, got the waitlist letter back in, I believe it was April of '01, and this was right before I was graduating. And I had also applied to the Kennedy School at the same time, so I was fortunate to get in there. Hmm. But was was kind of disappointed, so I had to figure out what to do with the next step. And one of my mentors was kind enough to make a call to Senator Joe Lieberman's office on my behalf, and um, I went to D.C. and worked on the Hill for um, about a year and a half. Oh, cool! That's that's awesome. And so you're you're working on the Hill and still thinking of getting into Harvard Law School. You you send in another application, presumably. Yeah, so I, I reapplied each year. I thought I thought a recommendation for Lieberman would work. Um, it didn't. Uh, was waitlisted year two, mm-hmm. um, and was waitlisted year three. And then the fourth year was also waitlisted, but finally got off of the waitlist. So I, you know, I left the Hill. I had deferred the Kennedy School, so I I went to um, HKS in the fall of 02 for a two-year master's in public policy program um really enjoyed it took a lot of classes at the business school and across campus and then um was finally called by the uh, associate dean of admissions my it was april of 2004 and offered a slot and so that's that's when i started up yeah you must have been so excited (laughs) so stoked to uh to get that and and how did you really develop the the willpower to keep going even after receiving those rejections uh, year after year? You know, for me, I kept thinking. I mean, you know as well as I do that law school admissions is such a black box. And so I've had people ask me who are, you know, I have students now in my classes who have applied to UT Law or you know, name the law school. They get waitlisted, and they're like, "Hey, what's the secret of getting off?" And I said, hey, if I knew it, I wouldn't have been on it for four years. Right. <laughs> uh, right? I mean, but I tried everything. I remember I took the train up to Boston from D.C., sat in the admissions office for two hours before someone was like, hey, we don't talk to applicants. Um, but say, oh, I just wanted to hand deliver some additional recommendations. Uh, I rewrote my, my um, personal statement four times. I you know, turn in more, you know, addenda, the, the infamous addendum, uh, opportunity. I took all of the freaking tickets I could on that and sure. turned in all kinds of addenda. It, it was sort of a game for me, I guess, in that maybe 
I'm not sure how I would have re acted if I had received a no. I may have given if I had received a no, to be honest with you. But I think the wait list was just enough of a glimmer of hope that I thought, let's see if I can kind of try to figure out what uh, the secret sauce is. And I still, I can't, I mean, who knows, right? Like, right. I ended up, it was me, and probably for your listeners too, I think just the process of having to be patient, hmm. but also the personal strategy element of really thinking about what this package looked like you know, every single year was a, an introspective process that I think helped me in the future. So uh, it, it wasn't great in real time. It didn't feel good, but I can say in retrospect that uh, I think it, it ended up helping me down the road. Yeah, I agree with that. It forces you to put pen to paper and just, just realize where you are in life at the moment and, and what your goals are, whether your interests or priorities have shifted. So it's a great exercise uh, nonetheless. And so ultimately, you, you do get into to Harvard Law School. And for, for those listeners who don't know what law school is like, can you pro- provide just a basic description of your time there? Uh, did you enjoy it? Uh, did you not? And, and kind of just uh, what you thought about it? Yeah, law school. Um, it's a weird place, folks. <laughs> so, I will say this, right? I'd been out of I'd been out of school for three years, so I had a little bit of perspective. I, you know, and just left grad school, so I had a bit of, I think, perspective that newly minted undergrads don't have. But in your typical class, so we had five hundred and fifty in my class. I was in a section of 70 and you had everything from like the 40 year old doctor to, you know, the recent Berkeley student. Um, it is a stressful experience. And I think what, what separates law school from the undergraduate experience is that you take one test that is 100% of your grade and that's it. Mm. Um, and you throw in the Socratic method as a teaching tool, which is not something that undergrads are usually exposed to, and it can create a hell of anxiety um, because you don't get any feedback other than you know what what the professor is is sort of telling you in response to your commentary, but you are nervous for four months until you get this exam and it's an all or nothing, you know, it's a zero kind of a yeah. zero game. Uh, and Adam, you know this too. And I think what was excruciating for us was that we took finals after the Christmas break. Oh, really? Yeah, they've they've since done away with that. But uh, <laughs> you know, you go home and basically be a nuisance to all of your friends and family members, and go back and then take the exams in January. So um, that being said, some of my best friends in life are from my section. Uh, I really enjoyed the second and third years. I took a lot of classes off the law school campus. Um, and I would do it all over again, even though I'm not practicing. Uh, I'm taking the bar in February of 19. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, yeah. I don't know why, to be honest with you. Adam. <laughs> uh, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, it's it's something that I, I never did. And I'm kind of intrigued to to jump into it and, and take it. Um, but Law school is, I would say this for people out there, I, you should do your due diligence, you should talk with attorneys before going to law school, yeah. Yeah. because the, probably whatever, and I'm going to date myself, you know, the Matlock version of the law that, or the law and order version of the law, um, exists in a very rare form you know there aren't many trials people don't go to trial they settle um so if you have these sort of dreams of standing in court and there are opportunities for that um but they're not as as plentiful as some people think so definitely do the due diligence i absolutely agree with you on that front and i think even uh another perspective on that is actually working in the the legal field before you go to law school um, just to get that tangible, hands-on experience. Um, people go to law school for a variety of reasons, and one of those reasons is, um, you know, modeling what they see in movies or television. And, and like you were saying, it's it's not exactly uh, like that. Um, but so when, so when you're in law school, your your first or second year, um, 
what are you envisioning that you'll you'll do with your career? Was the goal to work at a, a big corporate firm or, or something else? Yeah, so for me, the plan was work at a corporate firm, go from there into government. So either return to East Texas and run for Congress or state Senate. Um, and then, you know, the goal was governor by 40. So then find some way to uh, have a statewide elected office and then become governor. So um, I worked, you know, I clerked at Baker Botts in D.C. My first, my 1L summer, I split my second summer between Fulbright and Jaworski and Benson and Elkins, you know, two, two um, international firms, but based in Houston. I split my summer between those two firms and, you know, got offers, was fortunate to get offers from all three. And Adam, that's when I worked a football camp on a whim and everything sort of took a left turn. Yeah, and that's that's so fascinating. And it's uh, in the beginning of the book where you speak about your, your thoughts at that time. And and for those, again, of people that don't know much about law school, there's sort of this subtle pressure to, to go into these uh, big law jobs, these these jobs at big commercial firms. Um, not only are they prestigious, but uh, they pay well, and they really set you set yourself up for for the future. And a lot of people take those opportunities. And so the fact that you decided to go a totally different route is is fascinating, and it's something that uh, I'd like to hear more about. Just just what your thinking was at the time. Were you what, what was your uh, you know your risk tolerance for for doing something non traditional? What were you thinking at the time? Yeah, so Adam, I think you're being nice. Uh, you know, listeners out there, I'm of the belief that there's there's definitely some collusion between the law schools <laughs> and law firms. Um, so the law schools can set the tuition at an exorbitant rate, and the law firms understand that they can um, overpay first and second year associates because you have to work. Um, so they get you for you know indentured servitude. Um, so yeah, it, it's. You know, for me, I'll be honest with you, I worked at three firms. I never walked away thinking to myself, wow, I really want to be like that partner. Not in a negative way, not in the sense of like they were mean people, Mm -hmm. but I didn't feel like there wasn't an aspirational tug in the law for me at the time. And that sort of bothered me. I I was willing to dismiss it, to be honest with you. And I wasn't really searching for alternatives before I, I went and, and worked a camp in South Carolina with a buddy of mine and then just decided I want to be a football coach. And um, my risk tolerance is pretty, pretty high. My dad is a Baptist minister, always talks about the fact that you're going to die soon, so you better get right with Jesus. Uh-huh. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very much, uh, I think, a believer in time being finite and you need to bring your long-term goals into the present tense because it's not a given that you're going to make it um, to whatever age you think you want to achieve some of those things. So I was excited. Um, People around me weren't excited. My girlfriend wasn't excited at the time. Uh, Obviously, we broke up. Um, Mm -hmm. My parents were supportive. They were surprised but supportive. My classmates were bewildered, I guess, maybe is the term. Um, I had some really good law school professors who gave me great advice and were really supportive. So, um, that's great yeah. because a lot of the time it seems like people struggle to take action the, the way you did because of the expectations of others, especially you know family, friends, classmates, things like that. But you, like you said, you were getting positive vibes from from a lot of your your friends and family, which which makes it easier. Um, um, and, and so at that point, you know what, hold on, I'm sorry, Adam, and there's one thing I just, one point I want to make on this. Sure. I think that what you said is very true. And I think that, you know, for listeners, it, there will be points when you float crazy ideas by people in your circle. And sometimes their response will be based on their experience and not necessarily the forecast for you. So, they may not say it, but they may say, oh, that's crazy. It will never work because the last time they tried something that was similar, it didn't work for them. Right. So just be very careful about who you 
listened to. Um, I've had experts in all phases of my life try, try to tell me how to operate in a situation they've never been in. Um, I didn't have any lawyers in my family, but everyone knew what kind of law I should practice. Oh, right. Uh, right. Right. So it's like, okay. Yeah. Um, and I just, yeah, I just think that's a, I think that I emphasize is just be careful of the feedback. And uh, sometimes you just have to try to eliminate the noise. Yeah. Do you have any further tips on that? Obviously, you want um, to, to get some advice from people that, you know, clearly have your best interests at heart, but but like you were saying, they may not know exactly. E- either they're using their own life as a, their framework, or they don't really know what they're talking about. So, how do you navigate both of those? Yeah, I think you should listen to the advice that relates to tactics and not necessarily forecast. Mm. So, some people are very general. It won't happen. That's crazy. There's no way. Someone's already thought about it. Um, it'll definitely fail. Like those are more forecast driven, which now you're just pulling out a crystal ball. Um, but I would be very attuned to the to the advice that deals with, well, hey, um, this part of your proposal is flawed, and that's why I think they won't accept it. Now, that may be good feedback that you can go back and tweak um, the plan, right? But those blanket sort of forecasts, it's a guessing game, and so now you're just – you're really, you're choosing whether or not to give a vote of confidence to someone's ability to guess the future. Um, listen for the the tactics mm-hmm. and the 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 feedback on um, on what parts of the plan they think may not work. There may be some good data that you can use to maybe even improve your approach. So look look for tactics and not necessarily forecast. That's, that's excellent advice. And, and go, going back to a point you said earlier in the book as well, you say that your, your disinterest scared you. And at that point, you know, you realize that, hey, big law life working at a commercial law firm isn't exactly for me. But how did you then discover what was for you? You, you said you participated in this football camp uh, a little bit before you made that decision. But, but how did you discover that that was truly for you? Yeah, so you know, um, I wish Adam there was a very like good method, but I was a high school football player. That was the end of my playing days. Uh, I loved football, but I knew I wasn't. I was going to go to school for academics, and I wasn't going to get any offers. And my parents weren't really that invested in sports anyway, and so it wasn't one of those powerful narratives to me. But working a football camp for three days, everything came back to me that I loved about football. Um, You know, kids from every side of the railroad tracks and religion and color and socioeconomic status and all of that stuff just flies out the window and you have 11 guys trying to execute a play. Um, and, And by no means, I think, is sport in general or football in particular the answer to our problems but i do think that you know they're just very brief moments where race and socioeconomic status and what high school your grandfather went to those fly out the window and um you have some real camaraderie so that's what struck me at the camp Mm -hmm. and, and i just wanted to be a part of it and i felt like being a coach um was the way to get in yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, you realize at that moment you wanted to work in the NFL and making that decision is, is one thing, but actually doing it is quite another. And in the book, you talk about how you uh, wrote to all of these NFL teams looking for a job and you say you almost treated it like an election campaign. And I'm sure you, you referred back to your time at uh, UT running for president to, to help you out with that. Um, so eventually you, you get a call from Herm Edwards of the Kansas City Chiefs for for a training camp internship. Can you talk about you know how that happened and why you think uh, that opportunity opened up over uh, others? Yeah, so um, you know Herm's one of those folks who you know he's currently coaching with the with Arizona State, um, right. and he's just a genuinely good guy, and I think he's also someone who. Uh, 
you know, he's one of the few head coaches in the history of the game that never served as a coordinator. He went straight from a position coach to being a head coach um, of the New York Jets. So I think that he he sort of gets nonlinear paths. Um, and he's just a great mentor. And I think he maybe saw it as an opportunity to help me out. I really think that he thought I was going to come in for three weeks, sort of get my feel of it, and then go practice law somewhere. Um, and had he, I think maybe if he had known that I was going to harass him to stay on full time, he may not have given me the initial opportunity. <laughs> but uh, I'm grateful because, you know, I did a three week training camp internship. Uh, with the Chiefs at the end of so the third game of the preseason there are four games usually that third game is when they send all of the extraneous staff home and cut you know the rest of the roster down to what they're going to take into the season and I just begged him for uh, another week to let me stay on and he finally said okay stay out of the way um, he he set up a high school coaching gig for me so that I would work at Arrowhead go coach at this high school and then go back to Arrowhead. And that was sort of my day. But uh, it, it was one of the, I think the better educations that I could get in the sport. Oh, I'm sure. And and going into that, that internship that you had, um, how did you, or what was your plan to, to pitch yourself to the chief staff and players? Um, especially because, you know, you're coming from Harvard law school, um, didn't have that much football experience. Um, how did you, increase your credibility or in the organization so that they could take you uh, more seriously? Yeah. So I had this, uh, I think this is where the political experience helped me. I really, you know, I think having sort of this empathetic tilt, I had to, I really put myself in the position of the assistant coaches. And I thought to myself, you know, they don't give a damn that I went to Harvard law school. And in fact, they probably it probably will work to my disadvantage because some of these guys have played in the league. Um, they've coached for 20, 30 years. And the fact that I was able to get this position may rub them the wrong way. Um, they may not think, you know, maybe I hadn't paid my dues. So I walked into Arrowhead with the sense of I'm going to just listen. I'm going to be nice to people and I'm going to ask for work. And I'm not going to express my opinion on anything at all, whether it's football, politics, religion. I'm just doing work. And so I kind of embraced the grunt role because I just wanted them to to like me because I worked. And then I hoped that that would provide an opportunity for me to to advance in the organization. Right. And you you almost have to you know, take a to hit to your, your ego a little bit. Like you graduated from Harvard Law School, clearly a super intelligent person, and yet you may have to do some of the the most menial work that the organization required, yet that was the, the only way to, to proceed. And to I, I don't think many people understand the sheer sacrifices that you had to make. Um, you even talk about in the book how you slept in the stadium at, at certain points. Um, can, can you maybe share some stories about how you stayed humble and hungry in that time considering like the the roadblocks that you faced yeah so um you know it doesn't get much more menial than stocking the kitchen um the players ate breakfast in the mornings at the facility so a part of my job was to go through and see how much cap and crunch we had how many pop tarts were left and to fill the order um so i think humility was like because I was beneath the totem pole, it was sort of easy to be humble because that was just reality. Mm-hmm. Um, I also was sort of glad that I didn't have to contribute anything at a high level because I had the ability, I think in a really unique opportunity to sit in the back of the room and that was on offense, defense, special teams, team meetings, coaches meetings, and I just wrote, I wrote for six months. So I wrote everything, you know, halftime speeches, uh, coverages, offensive plays. Uh, it was a great learning experience. So it was almost, looking back on it, it was to my benefit that I didn't have to, you know, draw up the coverage for cover two against a certain 
past concept. I could just sit there and learn from from some of the best uh, football minds in the game. So it really, you know, it was a unique education. It was kind of like not leaving school. I was uh, in a student mode for that for that entire time. And then in terms of staying hungry, um, I believe in micro wins. So I would always celebrate small victories. So one time I was able to call, which meant, and um, the defensive coordinator invited me into one of his defensive meetings. So I was, I was happy and I celebrated that night. And uh, I mean, celebrated mean like um, I wouldn't got a beer and then went back. (laughs) I didn't run off to New Orleans or anything, but uh, yeah, I just think, I think really embracing the small wins helped get me through that. It was a six month gauntlet from training camp to, uh, to January. For sure. And, and along with that, you have to navigate the organization as well. And you were very deliberate in the way that you, you sought to ingrain yourself within the Chiefs so that there was less of a chance that the team would, you know, let you go after your time there. Can you maybe, so say like a listener just got their foot into the door for their dream organization and, and wants to stay and make a great impression, what, what can they learn from your experience with the Chiefs when they're going about doing that? So I I do think you can't over, you can't exaggerate humility. So regardless of your background, awards, whatever it is, especially for people who are trying to break into a new market where there may be some skepticism about your um, worthiness of being there, you have to start and end with humility. Um, I also think if you're making a drastic pivot, so you're going from law to you want to become a chef, you know, you're going to have to be a bar back or you're going to have to be the guy or the gal that's just sweeping up floors. Um, embrace that as much as possible and see that time as an opportunity for you to really observe what's happening at every level of the organization because that's invaluable um, content that will help to guide you when you do have to make decisions. And uh, and then finally, I would just say, you're going to have to go sometimes, you know, eliminate the noise, go off of social media, take some cell phone breaks, like get all in, like really be invested so that they're getting your best and you are getting the most out of the experience. Mm-hmm. Just Just going all in essentially and ensuring that you're you're going to make it work no, no matter what and you co- you clearly did with with the chiefs like i said you you slept at the stadium at some points and uh just made personal sacrifices to to make it work and also in the book if you could just talk about this quickly i, I love this idea of vis- visualization that you had um you said that you would see yourself on, on a team plane and in, in the coach's seat and you thought about the team meetings and how you would improve the process or keep it the same when you eventually became a coach. And I, I think that's such an awesome mentality and perspective to have. No one was requiring you to, to do that, yet you went out of your way to you know take notes on, on what you would do and build up a, a playbook, so to speak, so, so when you became a coach, you could become the best coach that you could be. Um, can, can you maybe talk about that a little more, why, why you thought it was so important to have the visualization aspect of it? Yeah, so I think that, um, I think it's tough because sometimes, so, you know, in one breath I'm saying be all in and kind of embrace the grunt role. And then I'm going to also say take some time to sort of peer out from the rubbish and um, imagine yourself in the leadership positions that you want to be in. So, for example, you know, I would see the head coach deal with cutting a player or deciding which players would be up for a game. So you can have 46 players go into a game with a jersey. So you're having to basically tell seven guys each week, hey, you're not going to travel. And so just hearing his thought process and, and hearing what he thought were the important aspects uh, in making that decision – I would then take that and then just say, hey, what do I think about this? Is 
do we need an extra offensive lineman or maybe is an extra defensive lineman more important based on who we're playing? And I would just walk through those scenarios. Um, and I thought it was a good mental exercise for me because it, one, helped me to kind of remember those decisions more. And two, it just also gave me a little hope that I can envision myself at some point, you know, making decisions at that level. Mm-hmm. And when you're you're doing this, are you going all in into your, your imagination, like kind of imagining what you'd wear or, or what the room would be like? Are you going like that detailed into it? Oh, yeah. I had, I mean, Adam, in my mind, I had my office completely decorated in my mind. I knew... I knew what kind of furniture I wanted. I knew, you know, you know. so a big part of the football environment is sort of what's the collateral up on the wall. So the quotes and the pictures and, and I knew exactly what I would want up on the walls and what slogans. And um, so I, I mean, everything, the dress, um, you know, what I would, what I would wear, what I want my other coaches to wear. Um, they seem like, you know, really minute things, but really as a head coach you are in charge of all of that um and so you know i thought it was a good exercise for me to just kind of put myself in that position one because i kind of gained an appreciation for um sort of the difficulty of the job and then two it just helped me to sort of frame my own leadership style um for for the for the game of football right Right, and it, it clearly worked, not to uh, spoil the book for anyone that hasn't read it yet, but um, you, you have a career with the Chiefs, and you take on uh, additional roles with the, the Lions, the Browns, and West Virginia University. Um, when you were at those other teams compared to the Chiefs, what, what was different about those experiences um, uh, compared to the, that seminal one that you had? Yeah, the Lions was a unique situation. We were coming you know, on the heels of a team that had gone 0-16, uh, which has only happened twice in the history. The Browns just did it, I believe, just only two times, maybe three. Um, so that was, you know, and this was a complete revamp of the organization. So watching the head coach and the new GM completely overhaul the team was um, was a rare was a rare opportunity. Um, West Virginia. It was another kind of interesting moment where West Virginia was transitioning. My first year coaching there, they were in the Big Ten or Big Ten, Big Eight, um, and then the last year, the Big Eight, the last the big year, the East maybe the Big East, the yeah. Big Eight. Is there, is there such thing as the Big Eight? Can I just make? <laughs> uh, uh, and then so it was the last year of the Big East and the first year of the Big Twelve. Right. So watching this team like West Virginia that doesn't have a natural recruiting base you know we would get maybe one player from west virginia each year in a good year um how do you compete with schools in texas um in the big 12 so that was another really good experience um and then cleveland was its own animal uh, um sure. just uh, a crazy city you know they love sports um and in an organization that you know we talk about morale um it's it's a it's a difficult place to wade through because they're just not used to winning. So, um, yeah, very, very different experiences and all with unique challenges. For sure. And, and eventually you, you decide to, to leave coaching and you return to the University of Texas where you started the uh, Center for Sports Leadership and Innovation. Um, can you just briefly speak about that, uh, why you decided to leave coaching and start up this new uh, center at Texas? Well, yeah, I got fired. Um, okay. So, you know, yeah. we all got fired. So we were we were on a multi-year deal. The first year we went 4-12, and 12, which, you know, in retrospect is a great year for the Browns. They went 0-16 last year. Right. At least I didn't mention that. Um, and so the owner walked in the day after the final game of the season and, and fired everyone. Um, and so, you know, actually, I don't mention this much because I've almost forgotten it. I took a, a job with the Houston Texans as a scout oh. uh, for four days, and then I quit. And I was doing it to kind of stay in the NFL. Um, it was crazy. I, I accepted the job with the Texans because my defensive coordinator hadn't landed with a team. The day I accepted that job, he became the D.C. 
with the Titans and offered a job to me, but I'd already accepted the Houston Texans scouting job. Um, scouting wasn't for me, so I quit after four days. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to take a sabbatical for a year, um, go back to Texas, teach a class. That was around the time the Ray Rice episode unfolded. Um, mm -hmm. And then I pitched this idea for the Center for Sports Leadership and Innovation to our president at the time um, to teach classes to our student athletes on leadership and financial literacy. And uh, so, um, you know, we've been at it for four years now, and we've had the support of Kevin Durant and and looking at ways to expand our reach beyond campus and Austin, but it's been a, um, it's been a challenging and a fun experience. And so, you know, this is another detour that, I mean, who would have, you couldn't have asked me, Adam, in 2006 sitting in law school to like chart this. Right. <laughs> right. Path. Like it didn't make any sense, but, uh, I turned 40 in November. And I think for me the the key takeaway is just, Stay challenged. Stay excited about what you're doing, um, and so it's been it's been a wild ride, but it's been fun. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to wrap up, if there's one thing that you want people to to take from your book and and from your story, uh, would it be what what would exactly would that be? That's good. Um, you know, I posted this on Instagram. A, f a year ago and then I reposted it again a few months ago but it's this question but did you die mm. uh, uh, and this for me is you know there's a lot of research around that's that supports that the brain tends to we tend to uh, give too much credence to the worst case scenario <laughs> so yeah sure you know, you think about the speech and you imagine yourself like your your pants falling down and everyone laughing at you and you get thrown into the streets and get flogged or something. Um, you know, and, and oftentimes, very rarely does the worst case scenario happen, but I think we give it too much credence. So I would say when it comes to rejection, to failure, to taking gambles, um, if you look back over the course of your life, First, if you're looking back, that means you didn't die, so it's okay. True, true. Uh, um, right? Like, at a very basic level, it's okay. So, you only get one shot to do this. I mean, this thing is, uh, time is finite, and it also, you know, it moves without asking us to set the pace. So, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna fly by regardless of whether or not we want it to slow down. So, uh, whatever you're thinking about and putting off, the one thing I know is the older you get, the more responsibilities you gain, the harder it is for you to make a pivot. So um, I would do it now. For sure. Yeah, yeah that's, that's excellent advice. And, and, well, this has been great, Darren. Uh, the book is really great. It's called uh, Call an Audible. And uh, you also have a podcast, I believe, called The Tribe Called Yes. So I uh, invite yeah. the, the listeners to check that out. And, and if people want to learn more about you or, or get in touch, uh, where, where should they go? So on social media, uh, at Coach DKR is my handle. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn and Facebook, just Darren K. Roberts. Uh, but would love to you know, reach out to me. I'm, I'm on those platforms and quite a bit. And um, you know, really appreciate you, you know, bringing me into the family and uh, allowing me to, to get with the bold listeners. And, <laughs> and I appreciate the work you're doing, Adam. Oh, well, thank you so much, Darren. Uh, you, like I said, the story is awesome. I encourage people to, to read the book. And uh, thanks again. It was an awesome conversation. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Right. Again, that was Darren Roberts, a Harvard Law grad turned NFL coach and author of Call and Audible. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. If you're interested in learning more about Darren and his journey from law school graduate to NFL coach, you can find Call and Audible on Amazon. That's it for this episode of The Power of Bold. Make sure to follow our Facebook and Twitter pages, and visit our newly designed website for show notes and a transcript of this episode. And as always, we would appreciate if you can leave a review for the show on iTunes or Google Play. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Power of Bold. 
For show notes and a transcript of this episode, visit thepowerofbold.com. Feel free to get in touch by visiting our Facebook and Twitter pages. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play. We'll see you next time.